Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our panel discussion today on inclusions uh, at schools in the UAE. My name is Fiona McKenzie, and I'm head of education at Carfax Education, and I'm delighted to welcome a range of very experienced uh, people here who are going to talk to us about inclusion and what that means. So I'm delighted to welcome Asha. Uh, Asha Karam is the head of inclusion at the secondary school for Dubai International Academy in Al Basha. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Ronell Rochester, who is the leader of provision for students of determination and Senko at GEMS Wellington Academy in Silicon Oasis. Uh, Stacey Bradwell, welcome. The, Stacey is the director of inclusion at GEMS Wellington Academy, Al Kyle. And Majid Hussain, we're delighted you can join us as well as the principal of the American School of Creative Science. Um, now, I've been in Dubai for some time, and I think this issue of inclusion is a really interesting one. When I first arrived here, it was really hard to find school places for children who didn't fit a very kind of stereotypical kind of norm. And I think that has changed, that landscape has changed phenomenally over the last few years. But what I want to sort of start off by understanding, or I think would be helpful for everyone to understand, is what does inclusion mean? Ronald, do you want to just sort of tell us a little bit about what, what to, to you, what does inclusion in a school community mean? Top headline. <laughs> um, top headline, I think, is it's finding a pathway for every student and, and not shoehorning a student into a set structure because that's the way the school does things, but actually finding a pathway that um, creates meaningful outcomes and qualifications that mean something to that student. Uh, that might mean changing you know, the, the, the timetable or changing that pathway quite drastically. Sometimes that can just be a few alterations within the classroom, but inclusion is catering to across all of those needs and across all of those pathways to make sure that students have a meaningful experience when they're in school. Brilliant, thank you. That's such a great, great summary. Majid, would you like to add to that? What, what do you feel that inclusion means in your school? I think what he said was uh, very clear, but I would also say um, no child left behind. So including every child in everything that you do by doing everything possible for them to get the learning the way they need it. Absolutely, so it is for taking that very kind of holistic view. Why, Asha, why is it so important to be inclusive in education? I know that's a very big question, but I kind of feel like in Dubai we're really kind of, I think, well equipped to answer that because it's such a focus for us here. It is. Uh, I think it is. We're, we're, we're doing really good in Dubai in terms of taking big steps because obviously, uh, you know, the UA government and the education ministries, they have all these frameworks in place, they have all these policies in place that do give us a voice and, ad, you know, advocate for inclusion within the areas of schools that we are. Uh, so those kind of difficult conversations that were hard before, because of all these policies that we have, have become easier because we now know that this is backed up from the policy standpoint and we're able to kind of support these students more. Uh, why so inclusion is important, I think, you know, my colleagues have answered you really well. No child left behind. I think that's a fantastic answer that Majid gave us. We really want all students to progress, get outcomes, achieve to the best of their potential. Uh, each child has their own potential. And I think uh, as a school to understand that it's not about comparison, it's about looking at that child's strengths and really working with them to kind of get them to that end point is what is important. Yes, exactly. So it is that it's sort of all encompassing viewpoint. Stacey, what would you add to that in terms of why inclusion is so important in an educational framework? I would say we're not just looking at children in schools, we're looking at children who we're preparing to be adults for the wider world. I know we talked about that earlier and we're going into different workplaces, different cultures where people have to be accepting of different challenges and strengths and I think for us as educators we need to really start that from in schools where that tolerance for different needs and people working to people's strengths as well so that it goes through everything and that's parents, children, staff in schools, and then that can go into the workplace as well. Yeah, so it really is setting these children up and setting everybody up for a future where we, where we rec recognize and celebrate that kind of neurodiversity. Um, I think one of the other things that I often get asked is what, what sort of range of, sort of, what's the sort of spectrum of things that comes under inclusion? Because I think that can be quite a, a broad term and I think it would be quite helpful to sort of define that a little bit. Um, Rana, would you like to start us off on that? Again, big question, sorry, <laughs> rolling them all to you. <laughs> um, I think it depends on, and I know different schools do things differently, but um, I would say you, you have your SEND department or, and, and that area where you're looking at special educational needs. 
um, ELL often falls part of um, inclusion as well. And then you also have your gifted and talented provision. Um, I know some schools split that into different areas and different sections, uh, as we do at WSO. Um, some that all falls part of the inclusion um, under the inclusion team um, or the SENCO provision. Um, so yeah, I, I would say those are, are sort of the three main areas. Um, there is a developing area of additional educational needs and separating special educational needs, which is a diagnosed long-term and substantial need away from students who may not have a diagnosed needs but have identified barriers to learning. Um, so it's constantly evolving, constantly developing, and I think what that structure looks, looks like um, is dependent on the school, their vision, and, and, and how they view inclusion. That's interesting. So it really it does vary kind of from school to school as to how they kind of what, what constitutes inclusion. Manjit, would you like to kind of add to that? What, what sort of range of sort of um, inclusion would you be delivering in your school? Well, it is the ascend department and the gifted and talented department. Uh, then you look at um, how are you dealing with the gifted and talented and what programs have you uh, done for them. From that, you branch to different uh, departments for the gifted and talented. For the um, SEND students, you uh, just deal with them according to their wave, wave one or two or three, and then um, you do the right accommodation uh, by them from your department. I think, Asha, how do you um, assess for students who are presenting, you know, for inclusion, how, how does that work for you? Because I think parents really need to understand how do you start this process? Because it can be quite a daunting process, I think. It is, and I think uh, as schools have moved forward in their journey, we have so many different areas to kind of look at and have a holistic viewpoint of a student, and that really brings in a lot of information about the students. So, of course, a, a lot of times working in schools, the teachers will pick up something because they're the closest people working with the student. So they'll pick up something and they'll then refer them to the head of department or, you know, the inclusion team. And then from there is where we start the investigation process. It can also be that we look at our data points at the end of the year, uh, and we see, okay, these are a couple of students who are really behind with their reading or in their English or, you know, with the, with the different assessments that we do across schools. So these are the two main areas in terms of teacher referrals and data points that we pick up students in terms of who may need more identification. And then a more holistic process starts in terms of, in secondary school, of course, the student has more than one teacher. So getting feedback and checking whether it's, you know, just a need in that subject that we need to kind of put support in, or it's a holistic need that we're looking at. Maybe doing some more external screeners and then having conversations with parents to see what their kind of experiences at home, are they facing exactly the same challenges? And that's how we kind of, you know, uncover in terms of whether the need is just a need, uh, a momentary, gap that we're looking at or it's a more sort of a learning need that needs to be further investigated and identified. So it's a holistic view that we try and gain of the child to then see what support will benefit them. So that's all very much when they're already with you and as, as they're kind of growing and developing you're kind of picking that up. Well it's a process up. right so obviously yeah. the provision starts once they're identified but the identification process starts from that referral or from that data point taking it further. So the provision starts only after they've been identified, after the intervention is in place. Okay, that's not work. Maybe there's another layer that we need to uncover. So till we actually make sure that the child is having certain needs, yes, it's a process that we start with the work. So it's like with. a constant evaluation is, of, of yes. kind of where that student is and, and kind of measuring that progress. But Absolutely. what if somebody comes to you, Stacey, who has already identified that their children has some kind of additional needs? How do you go about assessing that and working out whether, whether you can support them? Yeah, I think a lot of parents arrive to us who don't have an identification or some arrive who have already gone through that process. And I think it's for us, it's about supporting those parents to really understand what that diagnosis means, the impact that that might have on their child and also how they can support that at home. I think parents need to be open and be honest about what does work at home and that's where we then come in in that partnership. Um, we have a lot of students who come in undiagnosed. We do have some who arrive with reports already. And it's about sitting and having that conversation about what works, what strategies should be in place, and what doesn't work. Because even in a report situation where a child has been assessed, something may not work long term. And that's about parents then giving us that information as well. And it is, again, about that open and honest approach from school to parents and parents to school as well. I think that's such an important point that you raised there, Stacey, because quite often I'll have parents who come to me and say, you know, we have a diagnosis, but should we tell the schools? I'm like, yes, 100%, you should. But, uh, but a lot of parents are very nervous about that because they feel that it might impact on their kind of child's chances of securing a, a place there. Um, so it's always a sort of difficult one to, to navigate. Um, Ronell, what? how does your school kind of deal with that? If, if a parent presents and says, you know, 
I think, maybe, you know. I think it's about making parents feel as comfortable as possible in that admission process and really communicating the school's um, identity. In, um, in our inclusive nature is one of our visions at WSO and that's clearly communicated to parents so they feel comfortable in actually um, you know, uh, coming forward and, and mentioning a child's needs. Um, it, re it really helps us because it means that rather than us finding out you know, a half a term or a term in, we can begin that process right from when a child um, starts with us at school so that you know, valuable learning isn't missed during that time. So I think it's about schools communicating that it, it, it doesn't really affect the admissions process, but it really does help us to provide the provision for the child in order for them to reach their potential. Can I just add to that as well? I think I've been in Dubai 12 years now and the nature of Dubai has really changed and schools are a lot more open to supporting students and we have a lot more provision in place. So I think the more open and honest you can be, it sets your children off on the right foot into school as well. And then it's a successful pathway. If we're uncovering things later on, that can be more of a difficult conversation to have. Yeah, so it is about setting everybody up for success, both school and child, to kind of get the best kind of outcomes, exactly. Ajit, what about you? How do you find it, you know, are parents quite open in disclosing kind of challenges, or do you find it sort of tends to unfold once they're with you? The challenge is more than the understanding, really, because in most cases, parents are in denial of what is happening or what their child is facing. And even if they have the full report with the modification that is required and the accommodation, they tend to really object to doing so until the school has all kinds of communication and awareness with the parents to understand that this is for the benefit of your own child. This is not because we want to isolate your child from the rest. We are including your child, but we're just doing some accommodation and some you know, modification so they can adjust to the general education in, in the school. So it takes time, honestly. I'm not gonna lie and say, oh, all are understanding and um, you know, they understand and they trust. No, it takes a lot of effort from the school to get them there. That's in most cases. That must be a challenging conversations for, it is. for, for it you is a and big your challenge to have, yeah, and to kind of almost educating sometimes, parents. Sometimes it's a challenge to get them to really go and um, get their kids checked because they do not believe there is an issue. And we are not, I want to say, equipped to really um, um, get them what they need until we see specialized report from, um, you know, a known um, uh, area, but still, to get them to really go and get their own kids checked, it takes effort. And then to accept the modification, it takes effort too. It's very sweet. I had a family the other day who came to me whose child had asked if he could go and be assessed. Because <laughs> he said, yeah. I just think, I, you know, I, one of my friends says, and I think maybe I'm a bit like him and I'd like to go and be assessed, please. Um, and I thought that was rather sweet that, that he felt comfortable enough and that the climate in that he's being educated was comfortable enough for him to feel completely fine about that. That wasn't, wasn't a problem. It happens a lot more now. Um, we have students who come, you know, who, who will make an appointment with me and will come to my office and say something is not quite right. It is, it's great. There's also a lot of misinformation out there sometimes and TikTok and we have a lot of students, you know, sort of um, diagnosing themselves via TikTok. But I, I think it speaks volumes of how far Dubai has come in terms of inclusive education that students feel comfortable to talk to teachers about this also. Yes, and that, that conversation is now just much more generally accepted, I think, glo globally, which is, which is also kind of really, really helpful. Um, one of the kind of problems that I think was early on when the inclusion agenda began was that just simply weren't enough trained staff to kind of to support and to deliver this. How, Asha, how's that going now? I mean, is that being resolved in some way? Well, I think we are, we are moving forward with that, definitely. There's more interest in teachers to get more information and become, you know, get more educational qualifications in provision of students of determination and SEN students. So I think, yes, teachers do want to learn more. There are teachers eager to support students uh, with SEN and really take on that role. Uh, whether, there is, uh, whether there is a full qualification that can, that can help teachers with that, yes, there are, but then we just have to make sure that because we are planning to have an inclusive school, all teachers need to have that um, you know, understanding of STEM and awareness of how to support. And I think that's, that's something of a challenge at the moment because even though specialist staff will have that training and that support system, uh, five specialist staff in a school really can't go to each teacher of, say, 2,000 kids and really kind of train them as much as we try to do. Uh, but 
having that module within teacher training for every teacher, just not one module, but a whole sort of uh, a pathway of learning how to educate and how to support SEND students is something that I think that's the next step for, for Dubai, for the UAE, to see within teacher training, how can that be embedded further for every teacher to be an inclusive SEN teacher. Yes, because obviously if you've got children in every class, that, that's a sort of prerequisite, isn't it? How, how is that managed in your school, Stacey? Yeah, I mean, we have a specialist department, but even we will claim we're not specialists in everything. And I think needs have changed so much and there's so many different needs around that we can't know all the answers. And it is about that trial and error approach sometimes. And again, it goes back to having those conversations about what works, what might need to be adapted. And I think teachers are becoming more confident in that. And as teachers spend time in a school, they then obviously, they have children that move through their class group they will become more confident in dealing with different challenges. And I think it's just about having those conversations and really saying it is trial and error. We will get there and think different things work for different people. So it's about being flexible and having that we can do this approach. And I think teachers just need that confidence as well. And so, Ranel, I mean, when, you're, when you've got a sort of, you know, children who are students of determination or who have sort of additional needs, all your staff briefed on that. So everybody knows in every class that the adaptations need to be made? I, I think sometimes we have to be careful with how much information sometimes that we share, but most certainly, yeah, the, stu the teachers who are going to be working with those students, um, and sometimes that can be communicated via an, IE, uh, an IEP. Sometimes there are things that um, don't necessarily translate as well when you read them, and further intervention is needed in terms of, you know, working with teachers, sitting with them and explaining a, um, a child's needs. But I think it's very important, and you know, we, I think we've got a lot of specialised staff now um, in Dubai and across, uh, I would say, the GEMS network and within school. But it's about, um, as what's been said earlier, communicating that amongst subject teachers for myself as a secondary SENCO um, and making sure that they are all equipped in, in meeting the needs of students um, of determination. Manjit, what about you? I mean, how within your kind of school community, how do you train your staff to deal with that range of... I think of one of the biggest challenge is changing the teacher's mindset. Uh, to get them to really understand that this is not only the ascend teacher job, this is your job too. Um, that takes a lot of training until you get to that stage where you're explaining. Um, I have 450 staff and honestly, it is next to impossible to get them all on the same page. We do all kinds of um, um, reward system for the teachers who are doing excellent work with their SEND students, who are doing a perfect job. Of course, this is by the recommendation of the SEND department after they observe and see this is a teacher who's really doing all kinds of um, comments or accommodation that we're asking for because there is no way how can you be inclusive school when you are not including the child in the general education it cannot be the same teacher who's doing everything he has the child has to be within the group but then doing what is suitable for the child the teacher is the challenge and in most cases uh, teachers are resistant to change or they don't want to do the extras they want somebody else to do but then that requires a lot of encouragement from the school a lot of encouragement I said every year we have some kind of celebration and award ceremony for the teachers that did their best with their send teachers with the send students and um, that is working uh, so far Again, even as adults, we need praise. We need to feel appreciated. So, um, but that is a big challenge to get the teachers to really do um, what needs to be done. Sorry, may I just add to that? It's a good point that Majid made about changing teacher mindset. Uh, and I feel like a lot of times, as a specialist department, you know, we're always advocating for sense students and the teachers. Obviously, you know, they have their own fixed way of working and doing things as, and as much as obviously for them as humans, as much as they want to, uh, you know, really support each and every child, it does get hard. Uh, and I think as a specialist department, we coming from a place of support does help with that change in mindsets where teachers are like, okay, can I, I can approach this person and ask them that I'm in trouble. I don't know what to do. Can you help me? So instead of coming from a place of, you know, judgment, having, being a department that comes from a place of support really opens that you know, that door for teacher communication and teachers approaching us further and saying, okay, how can I do this? I'm struggling with this, but can you help me? And when you're there, then that just, you know, 
enhances the process further for that child. Yes, because I mean, as you say, it's a lot to take on, isn't it? You've got a class of kind of 25, lots of multiple languages, lots of different cultures, and you've got lots of kind of maybe EAL and also some additional needs, and you're also differentiating your level of teaching. That's, there's a lot going on. But I think what's really encouraging is hearing you all saying, you know, what, what it sounds like to me is this is, you know, where we started as sort of separate departments and children going to that department to be taught and being sort of pulled out of lessons. This is now, this inclusion agenda is now spread much more widely that children are in the class, the teachers are all embracing that, and are learning how to kind of meet those individual children's needs within the class environment. So I think that's a positive, isn't it? I think that's, that's a really kind of, you know, we're on the, on the right kind of trajectory there. Now, one of the questions I also get asked is, you know, obviously parents who come to me who have got children who are presenting either as gifted and talented or, or with additional needs, uh, is do I have to pay extra for this, Fiona? How is this going to work in the kind of school context? So, Ronel, I mean, how does that, how does that work? <laughs> it's the question... <laughs> that um, is my least favourite um, because I think everyone here, would, you know, we see ourselves as educators and we don't really like to discuss finances, you know, what, what the finance department's for. But um, in some cases, it does it does come at an, an additional cost when we're looking at really um, specialised programmes of learning or when that support goes beyond um, um, what we would consider standard practice within the school. Um, I, I don't think... Uh, that sits right with, uh, from want of a better word, maybe with a lot of us. But it, it, it is the sort of the way that education operates in Dubai. Um, but what I will say is, is that we try to reduce that as much as possible, um, and it's only where, like, absolutely necessary, um, within uh, with the students that we work with. Um, a common thing is having um, um, having to pay extra for an individualised learning support system. Um, and again, we do lots of different things to try and ease out on parents. And so rather than 100% um, supported throughout the whole day, we might reduce that to 50% and then therefore the price is reduced by 50% um, as well. And my, my, my view is that I'm preparing students to be independent. Um, so where possible, um, we look to reduce that support as much as possible as well. So yes, yeah, sometimes there are, it differs per school um, and as per the inclusion program that is in place. Um, but what I would say is, is, is that sometimes, you know, uh, paying that little bit extra for the support and the provision um, it really helps a student further along when they get to year 11, year 12, year 13 for us in British curriculums. Um, and you can see it pay off in, within those exam years. Yeah, so putting in that intervention in early and support in early can, can pay dividends later on. Majid, what about you? How does that work in your school? Uh, we don't charge extra for any SEN uh, or any um, of the gifted and talented. Um, what we have um, established with the parents is that if there is, depending on, <coughs> depending on what the child need, sometimes they need an LSA, so we ask the parent to hire their own LSA and to be with the child. And we have our own policy for LSAs, even though they're not our own staff, they're hired by the parent of this child, but there is a need. I have right now 33 LSAs in the school for the 33 that are in need of a person with them at all times. Those LSAs, the SEN department are the ones who are looking at their job and they're looking at their performance and they are in communication with the parents of uh, if they are performing or not performing to the level that we need them to be. We have recommended so many LSAs to be, sorry, <laughs> fired by the parent because they're not doing any help or any support that is needed. And we, we sometimes interview the LSA that the parent is going to hire. So this way, um, around 155 um, uh, students that I have in the school that are considered to be uh, uh, needing help, um, 33 of them, they need LSAs and the parents agreed to hire the person to be with them because this is a win-win situation for the parent because if they hired that person, then they can have their own work with them after school. They have, it's the same child, who, uh, the same person, who, same adult who was with the child in the school to go home and tell the parent so that is working perfectly right with me and this in in return makes the parent appreciative because they know most schools they charge more for uh, send students um, we don't and that has been working very well with us um, with the special education for those that need the extra help the parent they hired the LSA sort of outsource it back to back to the kind of parents yeah. Asha what about your model so I think my model is similar to both. Uh, 
it, it depends on the provision that the child needs uh, and depending on the specific child's need, it, you know, it's decided whether internal interventions will work. In secondary at the moment, I do not have any parent paid LSAs. Uh, we, we have, you know, a team of five LSTs and two LSAs who are able to manage their time during, you know, push-in sessions and then during not, no pullouts if the student doesn't have any exemption time. So we make sure that only during exemption we use that time of the child for, say, external support that they meet from my team. So at the moment we don't have anybody within secondary uh, for, uh, you know, who needs a one-to-one -one LSA support, but depending on the future and as, depending on the need of a specific child, if we see that becomes necessary, then yes, uh, the provision will be there. It's, it's about the provision, whether it's parent paid, student, you know, school paid, the provision for that child needs to be in place. I think that's the key thing, isn't it? Yes, is, exactly. Yes. Just to clarify, LSA, LST, learning support assistance. Learning yes, support, yes. teachers, I just correct. The, the, the apologies, parents, apologies. Parents we we say this day in and day out, so we <laughs> forget sometimes. There's too Terminology. many acronyms in SEN education, <laughs> yes. which itself is an acronym, so there you go. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's true, which is not terribly helpful, is it? And talking of which, G&T programs, <laughs> gifted and talented. I think it was really important that you mentioned that, Majid, because actually sometimes I think we forget that that inclusion is, is that whole spectrum. Stacey, tell me a little bit about kind of gifted and talented in in your environment? So we have, we try to keep our gifted and talented within class to really stretch and challenge them from the teachers who obviously in secondary are a specialist as well. So can really challenge that critical thinking. Um, down in primary is a little bit more focused on sort of that talent and going to competitions and different things that are going on outside of school as well to really in, give those children an opportunity to showcase their talents outside of school. Um, but it's all about the teachers really questioning children, making them apply their learning, really thinking about those critical thinking skills, again, to prepare them for that later on in the workplace as well. Um, so it's kind of, it's a focus, but it's within the teacher's remit as well. So I think it, it keeps it within that class so there's no ceiling on that learning for any student, whether they're identified or not. Okay, yes, so it sort of applies across the board. Majid, you, you were the one who kind of raised that initially. Tell us about how you well, managed that. Well, for the gifted um, students, gifted students, uh, talented is, is a different uh, uh, ball game. but for the gifted students, um, we have uh, programs that are running um, that separates them from the rest. So w whenever we have any opportunity outside of the school environment, the gifted students are the ones chosen to be representing the school in different things. Um, we also nominate them to go and be part of some research. Um, there's a, um, a research place um, in, in um, I, I forgot the name of the, it's uh, the, the research foundation and innovation hub in, in Sharjah. And that is a place that is now new and doing a lot of programs for the youth. Um, I think we have two groups that are going there um, on weekends and they're coming up with projects together. Uh, we are yet to know what kind of projects, but all of these things are opportunities that usually come in our way and we send our gifted students. Now, other than that, inside the school, yes, the teachers, they run different program in terms of academics, but in terms of activities, they are the ones leading any events for the younger students. They are the ones that you, um, they run a leadership class with the elementary students for um, after school activities. They run, I have one of them who is um, gifted with languages and running now Japanese language with the younger kids in uh, KG for um, after school activity. So all of these are opportunities that we are opening for our own students who are gifted students. I still feel there's a lot to be done, uh, but, but I, can I ask a question here? Because how do you make sure that these gifted students in your school are gifted? Are you the ones to decide as a school who is gifted and who is not, and how do you do it? Because for us, we, had to get specialists. So we had Hamdan Foundation that came and tested, categorized them A, B, and C, and D according to their giftedness, and we have around 144 of them. So um, other than that, before that, it was just teacher's nomination and teacher's recommendation. But right now I feel with confidence because it's an external body that did that testing for the gifted students is more of a solid uh, thing, but I don't know how other schools are doing it. 
Yeah, that's an interesting one, Asha. How, how do you kind of identify people? So I think similar to SCN, it's a holistic sort of a view. We have certain data points that we look at if a student is really high, say, in their ability tests of, say, verbal, we know, okay, the student with a really, you know, above average, above high ability for, uh, for English, then we go back and check with the teachers if the student is consistently doing well in that subject across. And, and then there's a teacher referral process as well. So teachers, so when all of this is combined together, we feel, okay, the student is, needs more than what they're getting in class. So of course the in-class provision is there where they're being challenged and you know, teachers giving them program. But then if they need something more, that's when they join our gifted program, which is called the Alpha uh, you know, Ability of High Learning Program for Higher Achievers students. So, that's how. So we look at a holistic point of view in terms of just not looking at teacher referrals or just not looking at you know, how well the student is doing in their academics, but also looking at certain data points and then having that holistic viewpoint, similar to the SEN identification. Yeah, so it's just a sort of continuation of that, but on a, on a kind of different sense. But I mean, it, is, it really does depend on the metrics you're using, I guess, doesn't it, to sort of judge? Yeah, so we have different criteria, and I think that's kind of judged by schools. Different schools will have different criteria based on the students that they have. Um, but it's going back to looking at the data and looking at across those assessments that we use as well. Um, and I think that's probably the same in Silicon Oasis as well. And it's about really looking at if a student's come out with really high scores, we then look at that holistic. Is it coming across in the classrooms as well? Is it just that the test was very strong? Is it something that it is strong on a daily basis? So again, it's getting that teacher feedback and parent feedback as well so that they can put their input into that as well. Well, thank you all very much. I think it's been a really illuminating conversation about the kind of the, the, the range of, of kind of, you know, the spectrum of, of support that you can all offer the, your students. I think the key things that have come out for me is the transparency. It's about really being open with, with parents and with children and how that can also be challenging as well in terms of having those kind of conversations. But it sounds like a very positive journey to me. I feel like we've come a long way in the last kind of 10 years and with the progress and people like you in charge, I feel very confident that this is a journey that will continue. So thank you all very much indeed for joining us today and um, good luck with with um, carrying on this journey and carrying the flagship <laughs> <laughs>